Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the name of Jesus. Come on. Put your hands together. Celebrate that powerful name of Jesus. He is so good. He's been so good. Father, we love you because you first loved us. And the greatest demonstration of love was that of sending your one and only son, King Jesus. Lord, thank you that we serve, worship, a risen Savior. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather as your church, to lift high the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for those that are, that are here today. Whatever may be going on in their hearts and minds and lives and back at home, Lord, I pray that you would speak a, a very clear word to our hearts today that you would change us for your glory and honor. And we ask this in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, take your seats. Welcome home. Welcome to Discovery Church. Glad you're here to worship with us today on your way in. You received a connect card and would you begin to fill that out if there's something going on in your life we want to come alongside and, and pray we believe there's power in prayer and so we want to pray with you would you just take a moment and fill out that connect card you can take it to the back side of that connect card and you can scan it with your phone it will take you to wearediscovery.co and so for those that are online we welcome you you can go to wearediscovery.co and uh, we just want to connect with you that's the best way we know is through that connect card and so that's wearediscovery.co .co. Uh, once again, if we can pray for you, man, we want to do that. And so would you just take a moment, fill that Connect card out. Uh, at the end of the worship experience, those offering plates will come by, and you can place that, that card in the plates as they come by. Hey, uh, let's prepare our hearts for the Word of God today. Would you draw your attention to the screens? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? All right, church, we are in week two of Won't You Be My Neighbor. Somebody asked me this week, aren't you doing that Mr. Rogers series? And I said, yes, we are. Come on, Won't You Be My Neighbor. That's where we're at today, man, week two. Anybody ready for the word of God today, man? I hope you're ready for the word of God. I'm amped up, ready to go. It's go time, and I hope you're ready to go with me, or uh, I don't know, you're going to be left alone. Okay, so we are in, in week two of Won't You Be My Neighbor. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Would you write this reference down? Colossians chapter chapter 3, uh, verse 12, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Hey, let's do something a little different, man. I don't know if you're comfortable. If you got comfortable, just got comfortable. But would you just go ahead and stand back to your feet? Is that okay? I know it's a little something different. Like, whoa, what, what's happening? Don't worry. It's okay. It's okay. We're not going anywhere just yet. Okay. Colossians chapter chapter 3, verse, verse, verse 12. We're going to read verse 12 and verse 13. Verse 12 and verse 13. I just want us to focus in, man, focus in on these words. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. 
bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against you, against another rather, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Hey, with those two scriptures in mind, would, could we pray? Would you pray? Pray with me. Man, don't just listen to me pray. Would you just, with those two scriptures in mind, would you just go to the Lord right now all over this place? Those that are online with us, would you just go to the Lord? Lord Jesus, I pray that these aren't just words that, that we just spoke out of our mouth, but that, are, that we're not willing to connect in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that, that your word, Hebrews describes is alive and active. It's able to cut through. And, and so, Lord, I pray that you would do whatever you got to do today in us. Whatever you got to do to get our attention, to whatever you got to do to make you number one priority in our lives. Lord, do a work inside of us. The Father, I pray that you would start with me. Start with me. So, Lord Jesus, we... We thank you for the power of your word. It's in the name above all names, Jesus, King Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, take, take back your seats. Take back your seats. We, we see in these, these two scriptures, verse 12 and verse 13, Paul's writing to the church of Colossae. Church of Colossae, right? It's a cool name, Colossae. He's writing to this church that, that he's planted and he's come alongside of, and he's writing this letter of encouragement to the church. And, and, and this, this, the, the, really the focus of Colossians and really all of his writings is that of unity. Is that of unity? He's, he's writing a word of encouragement. How can we have unity in the church? And, and so as he's writing with that perspective, think of that perspective, uh, we, we come across verse 12 and verse 13 of Colossians chapter 3. And we know that he's writing to the church because he starts off with, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. And then he says what? Put on compassion. Put on compassion. Well, last week we talked about how are we to be Christ-like neighbors. How can we be Christ-like neighbors? And it comes uh, because of our love for people and we love like Jesus. If we're going to be Christ-like neighbors, we must love like Jesus we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, here's this man that's making his uh, journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's been, he's been robbed, and he's been stripped of his everything, clothes and all, and he's been beaten, laid, left to die. And the priest and the Levite, the first two, they, they didn't have what the third, what the Good Samaritan had. And I believe what God's calling us is the church to have. There should be a difference. How many of you know there should be a difference for what we as the church, there should be a difference about us when the community looks at us. What are they seeing in us? I pray that they don't see what the, what the, the, the priests and the Levite, what, what people saw in them. I pray that they see what the good Samaritan possessed. And that was compassion. That was a, a love. And, and the world is able to see that love through us because, we, because we're connected to the love of God. And so he says, put on compassion. So that was week one. And, Next week, and week three, we're looking at, if we're going to be a Christ-like neighbor, we must serve like Jesus. And what does it take to serve like Jesus? It takes humility and gentleness and patience. And if we're going to serve, serve like Jesus. For as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, Mark 10, 45 tells us. And then in week four, we're going to talk about being kind, being kind like Jesus. If we're going to be a Christ-like neighbor, we must be kind like Jesus. And, and what does he write to the church in Colossae? He says, put on not only compassion, but he says, put on kindness. Put on kindness. And then we see in verse 13, bearing, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. So today we're talking about forgiving like Jesus, forgiving like Jesus. If we're going to be a Christ-like neighbor, we must forgive like Jesus. All across the New Testament, uh, we, as we read these letters, what we, what we see is not just some good suggestions. R really, this is, this is a part of who we are. Because remember, the old creation is gone away with, is done away with, we're new creations in Christ Jesus. 
And, and he says this, we have been forgiven, so now we're, we, we ought to forgive. We, we must forgive. Matthew chapter 18, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 18 with me. As you turn to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. But, but the context before Jesus shares this, this story, those that are listening that day, the previous scriptures leading up to this, this story, he talks about steps of reconciliation. Right? Steps of reconciliation. There's, there's different steps. Man, we'll go to, if somebody's hurt you, you go to that person. Let them know, man, hey, you've hurt me. Try to restore the relationship. If they don't want to hear anything, man, take some people with you. I mean, there's steps of reconciliation. And so it's because of that, that context, because of that conversation, uh, we look at verse 20, 21. Peter approached him and asked, verse 21, Matthew 18. Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven. Now, Jesus isn't referring, he's not literally saying, hey, 490 times. What he's saying is this word seven was a special number. This word seven represents an infinite amount of times, an infinite amount of times. And so Jesus is communicating to the disciples that day, and I believe he's communicating to us today that, that, that when people hurt us and people offend us, as difficult as it may be, our response should be that of forgiveness. And how do we do that? See, some of us are like, man, it's really tough to forgive people. You don't know how they've hurt me, what they've said. I lost my job because, I mean, all these things, right, we go through the list. By the way, that's where the enemy wants us. He wants us right there, kept in, in the mess. And Jesus wants us to be set free, and we only experience freedom through forgiveness. And so the response for the follower of Jesus is forgiveness. You know what our community needs? Man, we need a lot of things, right? You can go through a whole list. Of, you could do a survey, like go do a door-to-door -door thing. I mean, I, I, but you know what ultimately our community needs is to experience forgiveness. Practice forgiveness. Listen, it starts with the church. As we have been forgiven, we forgive others. And so Jesus begins to share the story. He begins to share the story in verse 23. He shares that a king, you, you, you can look, look, look with me as I, as I just share the, the story. He shares that a king decides to settle all his debts. The king decides to settle all his debts. And so he calls it a man who owed him an enormous amount. I mean millions, millions, if, if you really do the math of, as Jesus is sharing. Uh, a, a, an amount that he could never repay, right? Are you with me? I mean, it's just a, an enormous amount. And so what is the response of the one who owed this enormous amount? Jesus says that he begs for mercy. He begs for mercy. And so the king grants forgiveness, wipes away the entire Jesus continues his story. That would be a good place to stop, but, but he continues his story. He takes it one step further, and he says that, that one who, who was just forgiven steps out of the, the palace, right? Out of the palace, and he finds a, a servant that owed him just a small amount, a small amount. And what does he do? He grabs that man who owes him a small amount. He, he begins to choke him out and says, pay me what you owe me. And that man that's up against the wall being choked out cries out for mercy, begins to beg for mercy. The same response, by the way, the same response is the one who had just been forgiven. He cried out for mercy. So he's crying out for mercy. Owes him a small amount. And the one who had just been forgiven has that servant who owes a small amount thrown in jail. And there's some onlookers, right? There's always onlookers, by the way, just to let you know. There's always onlookers. Uh, you think you're doing something alone and nobody's going to see it. No, no, no. Uh, the eyes of the Lord, by the way, are in every place, uh, Proverbs tells us and declares, uh, looking over the good and the evil. There's always onlookers. The onlookers see what's happening unfolding before them, and they go back to the king and say, you know the one that you just forgave of this enormous amount who begged for mercy? You'll never believe what he did. He just stepped out of the palace and he found someone who owed him a small amount. He grabs him, he chokes him out, and, and he says, pay me. And he couldn't pay him, so he threw him in jail. 
And so look at uh, verse 32. Look at verse 32. Matthew 18, verse 32. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So, verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. So Jesus shares this story and then he closes it with verse 35. So my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives your brother or sister from your heart. You know what we see at the closing of the story? What we see is that unforgiveness keeps us bound in prison. And some of us are experiencing that today. And I pray, my prayer has been that you would be released from the prison and you would join the party. That's my prayer. But unforgiveness keeps us bound in the prison. And the practice of forgiveness, the practice of forgiveness sets us free so that we're able to enjoy the party. I want you to hear that today. The practice of forgiveness sets us free so that we're able to enjoy the party. And I wonder where you're at today. And just think about that personally. Where am I at today? And do I feel like I'm bound in prison? Do I feel like I'm in a dark place? Have I allowed bitterness and anger just to absolutely consume and control my life? Or am I enjoying this freedom? Am I enjoying the party? Am I living out the plan of God for my life? Mr. Rogers said in an interview years ago, he said this, don't miss this. There is only one thing evil cannot stand, and that is forgiveness. There's only one thing evil cannot stand, and that is forgiveness. How true is this? How true is this? Because it's completely contradictory. See, evil wants us, the enemy wants us bound by our sin. How many of you know we were at one point in our lives separated from creator God? In your life, my life, at one point we were separated from creator God. What we read about in in Genesis in the beginning Adam and Eve experienced a fellowship. They walked with God, and at the moment they sinned against holy God, things changed, everything changed, and every person born after them are born into sin, Scripture declares. And since the beginning, God has been pursuing you. Listen, don't miss this today. God has been pursuing you. He's been pursuing humanity. He longs for relationship with humanity. And He provided a way over 2,000 years ago. And our Savior, Jesus. Isn't the gospel good? Isn't the gospel good? He provided the the, the path to restoration and freedom. And it's found in forgiveness that Jesus Christ, he walked this earth. And he was crucified on a cross, taking upon himself the sin of mankind. Nailing that sin to the cross. So that you and I... And all who call upon him will be saved. See, forgiveness brings restoration. Forgiveness brings restoration. And I wonder today where you stand. I wonder if there's some friction with a family member or a friend or a coworker. And I wonder if today the Lord would use you to step in. And to restore that relationship. How do you, Tim, you don't know, man. You just don't know. The hurt is so deep. Can I just tell you that I believe that God gives us the power that we need. That all the power that you need to seek restoration is found in Jesus Christ. Now on the other side of it, can I just tell you that it's up to the person to receive that forgiveness. It's up to the person to receive that forgiveness for the relationship to be restored. But here's what happens. You are set free as you seek that restoration. You are set free. You're set free. You may never have that relationship back. But I believe that God is calling us 
to practice forgiveness. To not just talk about it, but as we have been forgiven, we are called to forgive others. Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, Jesus is is sharing with his disciples. What a powerful text, man, powerful text in verse 1. He said to his disciples, offenses will certainly come. Can anyone just agree with that today? Come on, somebody. All right, thank you. I'm not alone here. Offenses will certainly come, man. Offenses will certainly come. If you've never been offended, you are not living, okay? Can I just say that? All right, let me take it one step further. Man, offenses will certainly come. But here's the truth. Not only will you be offended, but guess what? Man, let me just get every eye and ear real quick. Not only will you be offended, but, but man... The truth is you're going to offend somebody yourself. Whoa, no, I'm too good. No, no, you are not that good, all right? Can I, just, can I just level the playing field here? Just speak some truth, some hard truth. That's like, whoa, I came for fluff. No, you ain't going to get fluff. All right, listen, offenses will certainly come, Jesus says. There are times that you are going to be offended and I am going to be offended. Guess what? In our brokenness, there's times that we are going to be the one giving the offense. Thank God even in those moments for his grace and his mercy. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. And in those moments especially, we are called to to practice forgiveness. Offenses will certainly come. But woe, are you with me? But, But woe to the one through whom they come. I love what Jesus does here. He pulls back some Old Testament, man. He pulls back some Old Testament with the woe. Like some of you are like, what is woe? What's the point of woe? All throughout the Old Testament, when we see this word woe, man, that's a pause, hold up, something's about to go down, right? That's what's happening here. And Jesus says, hey, offenses will certainly come, but woe, hold up, get ready, but woe to the one through whom they come. That's some accountability, by the way. But woe, but woe to the one through whom they come. Verse 2, it would be better. For him, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Pause right there. Pause right there. I mean, Jesus is going deep right now. He's going deep right now. He talks about a millstone. Anybody know what a millstone is? A millstone uh, was, is a large piece of concrete, and it's used to crush some things. Man, we saw a lot of millstones in Israel, and just a perspective uh, right there. And so a millstone was used to crush, to crush some things. And, and, and so Jesus is saying it's better for somebody to take one of those heavy things that crush, put it around your neck, and step into into the sea, to sink into the sea. And don't miss this next part. Then to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Then to cause one of these little ones to stumble. I, I truly believe what Jesus is communicating here to his disciples. He's communicating for a moment. Listen, if you're, you're, you're a, a, a spiritually... You, you've been walking with Jesus for a while, just say it that way. Can, can just hear me just for a moment. There's a, there's a calling on your life. How many of you know that your calling is to make disciples that make disciples? I mean, it's not just the job of the pastor to make disciples that make disciples. It's the job of, of, of all people who are in Christ Jesus to make disciples who make disciples. And so let me just speak just for a moment for those that have been walking with Jesus for a while. Jesus is communicating to the disciples here, hey, it's better if you just take that big piece of concrete and go sink yourself than if you cause another, a little one to stumble. As I read that, you know what connects with my heart? Connects with my heart is two groups here. One is young believers, and the second is literally young people. First, young believers. Hey, those that have been walking with Christ for a while, Man, you know, there's people that are watching you, just like children watch their parents, and really watch all people, by the way, right? You've had the fun comments. And just like that happens, so young believers are watching older believers. What a responsibility. What a responsibility. You know, over my ministry, over my ministry years, I can't tell you how many times somebody's come to me and said, Tim, you know, I saw this and I heard this. From someone that's, you know, been walking with Christ for a while, 
Is that, is that right? And sadly enough, in those moments throughout the years, my response is absolutely no. Because what does Scripture say? Ultimately, what does Scripture say? Go back to Scripture. Scripture is the foundation of our lives. And there's people that miss it. Hey, in those moments, those people need grace and mercy as well. And rebuke, but that's another message, right? And so, uh, but, but, but listen, man, don't, don't miss it. The older believers, the Lord is, is calling you to help build up younger believers. And so how you respond matters. How you act matters. How you react matters. What you post on Facebook matters. I mean, all of these things, listen, matter. Because there are people that are watching and listening. They're watching and listening. Not now worried about the younger generation. Man, I love the, I love the younger generation, man. I, I love them. They just, they're, they're, just they're, they're watching everything that you do, and they're listening to everything that you do. And it's amazing, isn't it? Come on, parents. It's amazing. Some of you don't want to admit it, right? Some of you don't want to admit it. It's like, yeah, they've said, they've said some things that I have said, unfortunately, in public, in front of people. And, uh, yeah, so there's that, right? But listen, don't miss this, man. Jesus is communicating to the disciples. And what a word for us today. That there are people, younger generation. Listen, unforgiving younger generation grow up to be unforgiving adults. Don't miss that. What we're teaching and communicating right now matters. What are the younger, what is the younger generation seeing and hearing in us? What are they seeing and hearing in us? I've often wondered why some adults act the way they do. Can I just, I just be very frank? I've often wondered why. Why can't we forgive? Why can't we love? Why can't we speak kindly? Why can't we do all these things that just should be who we are? And I just, I, I, I go back and I think, I wonder who walked with them. Who was the example for them? And can I just encourage you? Man, as we think about the younger generation, one day, the older generation, we will die. And we're going to pass the baton over at, at a point for the younger generation to lead the church. How are we preparing the younger generation to lead the church? How are we preparing them? How, how, what are we teaching them? What are we communicating to them? What are they seeing in us? And I pray. Man, I pray that they're seeing love. And that they're seeing forgiveness. And that they're seeing grace extended. I, I'm thankful that at a young age, I had parents that, that shared with me, Tim, learn at a young age to forgive people. Because for the rest of your life, people are going to hurt you. They're going to say things that hurt you. They're going to do things that hurt you. Learn at a young age. And they taught us, they taught me and, and, and my brothers and sisters at a young age to forgive people. Because for the rest of our lives, for the rest of my life, there will be people that hurt. That say things that hurt and that do things that hurt. And there's some adults that have never connected with that. And so you struggle and wrestle with forgiveness because you've never connected. You just expect people just to, to you know, automatically do things, you know, like, like love you. And that's just, that's not the case in a broken world that we live in. There are people that are not walking with Jesus, they're walking in sin. They're more consumed about themselves than anyone else. And so Audra and I are, are doing our very best to communicate to our two little young ones that there will be people that hurt them. By saying things and doing things. And, and we have to forgive them. And we're able to forgive them through the power of Jesus. I want you to hear that today. It's not something you have to, man, that's a, lot of, that's a lot on me. No, no, no. It's all on Jesus. It's all on his power in us to be able to forgive, to be able to love, to be able to serve, to be able to be kind. Look at verse 3. Be on your guard, Jesus says. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he, if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, 
You must forgive him. Some of you are like, nah, that ain't happening, man. <laughs> I'm fighting that. Hey, you're fighting that, you're fighting Jesus. I don't know what to tell you. Listen, repeated forgiveness requires a certain level of spiritual maturity. Repeated forgiveness. People that keep coming back, and they keep coming back, and they keep hurting you, and they keep hurting you. Now, by no means am I saying, man, people that are constantly hurting you and offending you have to be your best friends. Man, not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we need to forgive them. And I'm saying it because Jesus said it. And if Jesus said, that's enough. But as people continue to come into our lives, man, we're, we must forgive them. And once again, that, that repeated forgiveness requires a certain level of spiritual maturity. It, it's a gauge for the growth in our lives. Are we growing in Christ? I believe we can see a gauge in our life if we're able to forgive people. We're growing in Christ. I'm able to forgive people. Man, I'm growing in Christ. Praise God. I'm becoming more like Jesus. Listen, the mission of Discovery Church is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of, of Jesus. That's the mission. And one of our four values, one of our four values is next steps. One of our four values is next steps. We want people, we want to help people take next steps in the faith journey. Take next steps in spiritual maturity. Once again, this is a part of it. That repeated forgiveness requires spiritual Maturity. Note verse 5. Man, don't miss verse 5. This is the disciples' response to Jesus. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. I mean, so many times, we could just overlook this completely, but we would be doing ourselves an injustice. Listen. Jesus says, this is what it takes. This is what forgiveness looks like. Here's the framework. And I love the disciples' response, man, their honest response. Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. There are times in all of our lives that there's a... Requires, you know, faith to forgive. Man, we don't want to forgive. We're fighting the forgiveness thing. But Lord, I'm stepping out of faith. I'm trusting in you. I'm relying on you to practice forgiveness. The faith to forgive. The faith to forgive. Listen, today, there's two different kinds of people here today. There's those that, there's those that need to release someone that has hurt you. There's someone that, some here that need to release someone that's hurt you. And there, there's others here today that need to receive forgiveness. Don't miss that. There's, there's others here today that need to receive forgiveness. I don't know where, where you're at today. And I don't know what's going on in your heart, in your mind. But my, my prayer is that we would just simply say, Lord, have your way in my life. Give me the faith to forgive. And Lord, give me the faith to receive the forgiveness. Would you just bow your heads and, and, and close your eyes all across this place for a moment? I want to invite you just to get alone with the Creator. All across this place. Just get along with, with the Creator for a moment. Man, I don't know where you're at. I, I can't answer which part of this message is for you. I, I can only do that for me. I don't know. If it's you, that, then you're living in that prison... been saying when am I ever going to be set free you know today you can be set free
Yeah, you can be set free. But if there's anyone in your life, would you just ask the Lord, if there's anyone in your life that you need to forgive, is there anyone in your life that you need to forgive? encourage you before you take another thought, before you take another step, another action would you do that right now would you start by saying Father increase my faith I forgive this person call them by name I don't want to be bound to this prison anymore. I want to be set free. Your word talks about peace. I got no peace. I see all kinds of people with peace. you to know today that the Lord longs for you to experience his peace. And that comes out of forgiveness. Have you ever experienced his forgiveness personally for you? Could today be the day that you surrender your life over to Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I've come that they may experience freedom, life, life abundantly. So all across this place, say, dear Jesus, I want to experience life anew. That is life in you today. I believe that you came to this earth you were crucified on a cross placed in a grave and you rose victorious from that grave for me for the world and today I accept the greatest gift ever given and that is salvation in you alone And it's through that salvation that I'm able to forgive. That I'm able to step out of this prison and experience the party. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray, Lord, that we would look to you that our hope would be found in you. That, Lord, we would rely completely on you. And that we would be the church that you have called us to be. And we ask this in the one and only name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Church, at this time, we're going to continue to to worship God through giving of of tithes and offerings. This is, is to me, this is a very holy time. This is a form of worship for those who 
have called upon the name of the Lord. This is a time for my, my wife and I, for our family, that, that we say, Lord, you're a priority in our life. We trust you. Even when the, a lot of things aren't making sense, we trust you. We trust you. And so I'd encourage you, I'd invite you to go to weirdiscovery.co. And on weirdiscovery.co, you can click on the giving link. And, and there's some other ways to give, giving online, texting to give. There's a giving kiosk right outside of in the hallway, and I encourage you to be faithful in giving of the tithes and offerings and allow the Lord to, to, to bless you and to provide to provide for you. Quickly, would you draw your attention to the, the screens one more time? At Discovery Church, we, we partner with, with several local uh, and global nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, and one of the organizations that we are thankful for, the partnership that we have, is Four Kids of Treasure Coast, and, and Kenya is with us today, and, and we're so thankful for her work and the Lord that uh, the work that the Lord is, is doing through her and accomplishing through her uh, right here in St. Lucie County. Uh, children that have been placed into the foster care uh, program and, uh, and it's, it's their goal, their, their ministry's goal to uh, take these children and to place them in homes, in Christian homes, that will show them the love of Jesus and care for them and, uh, and disciple them and point them to Jesus. And I'm so thankful for, uh, for her work and for the work of, of this awesome organization. We have the privilege to come alongside of them a few times a year, uh, one of those being Love Week. And, uh, and it was a home, I think there was 10 kids there, maybe 11 that time. I think 11, 11, right? And so 11 kids in that home, and, and it was a rainy day, man. It was a nasty day, right? And, and we tried our best to just show that, that, that family some, some love, to help them do some things around the house. I mean, with 11 children, can you imagine? I mean, Kenya can imagine, but most people can't imagine. I mean, 11 kids in a home. And, uh, and so we were able to paint a room and, and trim up some, some, some hedges and rake the yard in between lightning strikes. And, and, uh, and then last year, uh, we, we, blessed the, uh, we were able to put the, this, this place set together for this family. So we've done different things throughout the year uh, through our partnership with four kids. And uh, as, I, as I shared earlier, you know, Audra and I, uh, we wouldn't experience what we're experiencing right now with these two beautiful girls if it wasn't because of the relationship with Kenya and, uh, it, and, and four kids. And so we're so thankful. We're so thankful for the, the work of four kids of Treasure Coast. Uh, as, as we close, uh, Kenya's going to be uh, standing uh, with, uh, with her information. And I would just encourage you, wherever, most of the time when we think foster, uh, we, we think, oh, it, it's only for people. Amen. Okay. It's only for people that... Um, Throw me off, man. It's it, it's only for people that you know are able to to take in children in their home. But that isn't the case. That isn't. I mean, yes, that is a huge need. But there's so many other ways that 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 people that are not able to do that for for various reasons. There's so many other ways that you can come alongside and support this 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 incredible ministry. And so I want to encourage you to stop by. Uh, you're not making any commitments today. Certainly, ask questions. Um, take some information, go home and pray and say, Lord, what would you lead me to do uh, today? What would you lead me to do?
And, and, and so um, I want to, I do want to pray over Kenya. Uh, Kenya, would you just come on down here? And, and uh, as I said, we're, we're so thankful for her and for her work and, and, and the work of this organization for Tim, the director, and, and others. And so this is a big day, by the way. Uh, it is stand. It's just stand. Stand Sunday. Stand Sunday. And so because of stand Sunday, I, I think we should stand uh, once again. Come on, stand to your feet. This is stand Sunday. We're making a stand for children that, uh, that are in need of love. And, uh, and so, man, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Uh, would you stretch out your, your, your hands towards Kenya and, uh, and just lift her up, her family, and this ministry? Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for how you provide for every need. Lord, thank you for the families that are stepping up today all across this county, all throughout the Treasure Coast and the state of Florida and beyond that are, that are saying we will, we will be the church, not just talk about being the church. And, uh, Lord, we'll be faithful and obedient to you. Lord, that's, that's all we're praying today is, Lord, that we would respond in a way that would bring you glory and honor. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bring the homes, you would open up the homes that are needed for the children uh, that, that are right here in our community. And so, Lord, that you would be glorified in this and through this work. So we love you, we thank you, and we lift up our, our sister to you, her family, and the strength that they need to continue to serve you and honor you, and glorify you. And this is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, lady. So on your way out, see, see, see Kenya. Man, stop by. Ask for some information. Uh, this is the second, last thing, and, and we we'll close out today. Last thing is we held a family meeting. If you call Discovery Church, your, your family... Uh, or you want to support, uh, you know, and, and Discovery Church and, and, and the, the years, the next year coming forward uh, with the next chapter and all that God's doing. We want to fill you in on some information with the next chapter and uh, in December. And so we're going to have a, uh, Mike Sinchek is going to lead a conversation in the coffee venue. And, uh, and so I love, if you call Discovery Home, then uh, I see Mike Sinchek. I'll be over there as well in the coffee venue. And we'll just update you if you weren't able to make the meeting. Uh, yesterday or the meeting that happened after the first experience. You can make the meeting now, uh, the second experience. God bless you. Hey, week three next week, won't you be my neighbor? We'll see you.